I'm a second year student at the Center for Curatorial Studies at Bard College. Um, I'm so excited to be here for this evening's talk and huge thanks to Nick and Bard Mieblam for hosting. I'm gonna start by briefly introducing the exhibition and tonight's speakers. Um, then I'll go ahead and turn it over to Manuel and Jensen for the duration of the event. Um, so Yacht Metaphor, the collected works of Cory and the Abyss is a browser-based exhibition that explores the work of artist, poet, and meme creator, Jensen Leonard, and is presented as the exhibition component of my thesis research here at CCS. As such, the exhibition can be viewed both online at the site's web address and in person through a physical installation inspired by Y2K era internet cafes um, installed at the CCS Bard Grad Lounge through the end of May. Uh, additionally, Leonard's work can be found on view um, on a billboard just installed on Route 9 in Tivoli, uh, in upstate New York, uh, yesterday. Um, so the website is co-hosted by CCS and online exhibition platform External Pages. Yacht Metaphor is both an exhibition of Leonard's meme catalog as well as an artwork in itself. The online exhibition takes the form of a didactic custom-made website created by Leonard and web developer extraordinaire Clay Colonna, aka DJ Poodle Emoji. Um, through an immersive and interactive underwater escape, the online showcase presents a selection of the most iconic Cory in the Abyss memes created between 2015 and 2021, accompanied by extensive annotations by the artist. Additionally, the site offers multiple points of entry from an in-depth origin story to an extended catalog essay by artist and poet Manuel Arturo Abreu, here with us tonight. The website creates a new context for looking at Leonard's work within their native online environment, yet distinctly separate from the infrastructure and algorithms of contemporary social media platforms. It invites viewers to engage with the artist memes, both as contemporary net art and as an unexpected educational entryway into complex social and political theory. A little bit more about our speakers. Um, as the legend goes, Jensen Leonard was born in Detroit, Michigan and raised in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He began making memes under the alias Cory in the Abyss during a six year tenure as a cook at a Belgian waffle kiosk in 2015, drawn to the immediacy and reach of instant publication on social media. While most meme creators make work that feeds off of the daily news cycle and viral online trends, Leonard instead focuses on creating what he calls evergreen images, content that remains consistently relevant over a long period of time. Embracing the appearance of an almost absurdly high production value, Cory and the Abyss memes mine the visual language of mainstream news media, advertising, and mass entertainment. These carefully constructed images pit capitalist American visual culture against itself through pastiche and satire. Um, I was first introduced to Jensen's work, obviously through Instagram, but more seriously through an interview Manuel and Jensen did for AQNB in 2017. It was through this interview and a deep dive into Jensen's work and Manuel's writing that I became increasingly interested in these memes evergreen nature and more broadly the relationship between humor, critique and race, particularly within the online space and considered what it might mean to push back against the infinite scroll of the internet and tireless production of online content to create a space to look closely at this body of work and its many layers. Um, Manuel Arturo Abreu is a poet and artist from the Bronx. They work in text ephemeral sculpture and what is at hand in a process of magical thinking with attention to ritual aspects of aesthetics. They're author of two books on poetry and one book on critical art writing. Their writing has appeared at Rhizome, um, Art in America, Cura, The New, New Inquiry, Art Practical, um, and AQNB. Recently, Manuel has turned their attention to Bard alums, Rindon Johnson and Brandon um, and Dife for a recently published article in Extra titled Sculpting the Black Generic, which I will um, drop a link to in the chat. Um, it was really important for me to have Manuel as part of the project and involved in tonight's conversation not only because of this first 2017 interview, but also because of their role in theorizing some of the most more potent concepts illustrated in Jensen's work, 
from online imagined black English to the writings in, on the canon of net art. Um, for that reason and more, uh, it's a great honor to turn it over to our speakers tonight, Jensen and Manuel. Um, so go ahead and do that now. Hello. Thanks for uh, Thank you. having us tonight at uh, the Bard Man Lab. Um, I prepared a presentation, so I'm going to go into that. It covers a few of the uh, through lines of my, my work, and uh, it just contextualizes it a little bit. So I'm going to do that. Uh oh, my internet connection is unstable. Oh, uh -oh. stay tuned, everyone. So Jet set radio realism, which is important. So, a little bit about myself. I'm from Pittsburgh. I went to an all boys Catholic school, high school called um, Central Catholic, which was a giant Division I football factory. Um, I ended up going to Kane University, which was a small Jesuit school down the street. I really didn't put much thought into college. I just know that it was uh, something my parents demanded of me, so I didn't really question it. Um, and there, it was just um, overwhelmingly bland and wasp and culturally bankrupt. I mean, there was just so many, uh, the, the Ugg boots and North Face fleece combination. And, um, I guess being in those circumstances, it really um, helped me and my, my friends form like a really strong sense of community, um, communes around just smoking a lot of weed and listening to obscure jazz records we'd find on, on blog spots and uh, reading poetry. And uh, I originally started out as a digital arts major, but I couldn't keep up with the professor, the, the tiny mouse cursor on the overhead projector screen moving and clicking little menus. I was that person that was always raising my hand, just slowing down the class. So two weeks later, I dropped that major. My, my friends, we were all like English majors and we pretty much read all of the, the modernist canon and we talk about Sister Carrie and uh, Chickamauga and Upton Sinclair and Mill Hurst was extremely generative despite the cultural malaise of Duquesne University. Pittsburgh, <laughs> which is just, you know, what is Mediterranean other than spicy white? Um, and then being the the auto poetics of the end of social media. Um, just going down this wormhole of Tumblr, Twitter, and Facebook. And there was from around 2011 to 2017, I would say was the epoch uh, of Facebook. Leftist memes, hard witty memes were coming out of Facebook. And it was like a tiny, micro artistic renaissance, but with macro repercussions in terms of the, the post reach that our content was getting people that were seeing the work. Um, and then just taking um, these politics and, and slowly, medically making them bubble into mainstream consciousness. Um, and from their phones with a few apps. So this is um, a screen capture of my submit in 2019 when I was writing lots of poems and submitting them. Um, so there were two poems accepted out of, out of, or two entries accepted out of 51 over about a four year time span, which is, I think, a, 
less than 2% uh, rate of acceptance. And so all of this rejection from these poetry journals, uh, not only was it sobering, it motivated me to figure out how do I, how do I contemporize poetry for myself? How do I make this exciting? How do I stop feeling like I'm writing in a vacuum with this impersonal dynamic of sending my labored over precious work to publications that may or may not want it and then getting rejected? Just this en endless food feedback loop of rejection. It's not to say that I don't have, um, you know, the skin, the thick enough skin to accept rejection as part of the artist's life, but it's not something I care to romanticize. So conceptualism in the wild, um, this is a block quote Bach. Darren Wurschler has coined the phrase conceptualism in the wild to describe writing that has arisen totally outside the purview of poetics, but that has nevertheless seemed absurdly familiar to practitioners of conceptual literature, because without intending to do so, such writing appears to exploit the same kind of uncreative technique normally deployed by the avant-garde for the literature. Such conceptualism in the wild does not originate from the institutions of literature, nor does it get validated by the practitioners of literature. The phenomenon at the crux of meaning itself, showcasing the degree to which language finds its own aesthetic potential, through disparate slippages of text all the way, any consolidated recuperation by the avant-garde. And so when I think of this quote and this idea of conceptualism in the wild, I think online meme creators who are using these typefaces to create some different fonts and wet looking fonts and flame fonts, and uh, yeah, it's just, it's some next level shit. Conceptualism in the wild, it's, it, it doesn't concern itself about any of that. So in that, in that case, there is something, um, I guess, isn't the right word, but un, untainted, no, a synonym for between one of those words. And, um, so this is an example of the memes I was encountering sitting in the waffle kiosk uh, with downtime. This is by the artist Addie Borneman. It's probably made between 2016, 2017. Another lettuce dog piece. And there was just something about um, memes as having a, a topicality that is so current that it outmodes, it outpaces traditional um, sources of media. That, that was part of the appeal. This was a meme I made with my Cory in the Abyss page. Um, I finally decided to dip my toe into the water, pun intended, uh, <laughs> in 20, late 2015. And there's a show that's so Raven, and there's a spinoff called Corey in the House about a chubby little black kid whose whose dad becomes the executive chef at the White House, and all of the hijinks ensue. And there's a Twitter page called Corey in the Noun, which every day says Corey in the uh, hydrogen collider, collider, Corey in the subterfuge, Corey and so forth. And Corey in the Abyss, uh, that tweet went viral. I just thought it was gut rich, gut, gut rich. That's hard to say. <laughs> and uh, I had to make my internet persona around that. Um, so this was the first meme I made that went viral. And in about two weeks time, according to the Facebook metrics, um, over 400,000 people saw this image. It's the White Ranger from Power Rangers. When you're an avowed anti-racist, but still benefit from wh white privilege. Then eventually I messaged Addie and eventually um, she agreed to help boost, share my page's content 
in exchange, in exchange for creating uh, lettuce dog style memes. Um, and eventually we got the page to over 100,000 followers on Facebook. And then it got mass reported by just an alt-right group that congregated on some forum and uh, architected just a, a mass reporting. And the page got taken down um, basically around like an argument around like anti-Semitism, but it was unfounded. It was just like so many people reporting it. And um, yeah, Addy, when the page went down, it was pretty devastating because we had built it up and I was getting so much joy out of, um, you know, the catharsis of making memes, but also feeling like I was informing and dictating uh, discourse and, and visual culture. She took about two months off, just like, just offline. <laughs> just to figure shit out. Names I made, um, the stylist dog. There were three or four different fonts that we worked around, just put over stock photos. And I, I liked uh, the meme as just a, I guess my, my style of writing poetry, my lines, one of my professors said was full of um, short, terse, um, compacted resonances. I was like, what does that mean? But I understand what that means entirely. It, I guess I, um, I like to sandwich in as many references as possible. So with this meme, you have, um, you have on one hand, the father clothing the daughter. You also have like the white nuclear family. And then you have the daughter espousing uh, Foucault. This melding of the nuclear family, Foucault, post-structuralism, all in a meme that you will encounter. This is another meme I made in, I think, 2016, Bill Clinton. I think any time you, you can, uh, just shit on presidents. That's like good praxis. Just don't stop shitting on presidents. Um, yeah, and just trying to show that the Clintons are extremely culpable, um, you know, and make people question why there are like political dynasties, why the same people with the same last names and the same proximity to those same last names keep uh, being president. Resist the socialist meme lords radicalizing Instagram. Uh, warning vice. <laughs> but uh, according to Jensen Leonard, known as Corey in the Abyss, socialist Instagram is on the rise. I see a new socialist meme page pop up every day. He told me lots of people are getting radicalized and brought into political consciousness through me. I think their intent is fomenting. At bare minimum, it feels like an inevitable dialectical moment of contestation. So I would say uh, my enthusiasm <laughs> has waned since then. Um, my opinion on social media is that, um, well, it changes, but right now I've been thinking a lot about uh, my peers and a lot of people online in these leftist lefty spaces, whatever that means, and constant posts, and how much of it is uh, indeed dialectical? How much are we working together to ask better questions that are uh, apropos of the ever-changing social, material, and political conditions? That, that, that dialectical uh, commune of, of inquiry, shared collective inquiry versus um, the sort of neurotic uh, compulsion to post every day. That thing, which is, wow, every day you have to post something, you have to be seen and heard. Do you think there's like, I, you know, it's just, 
there's there's got to be you know moderation <laughs> at some point right are you are you not tired i don't know um a few of my influences include the poet playwright and mary baraka graphic design studio pen and pixel and the aforementioned uh, jet set radio video game um and i feel like with memes my really the raw material is the internet and so that means um doing a sort of archaeology anthropology what what have you mining this vast nearly endless um treasure trove of pngs and images that even if they have um watermarks, I can still right, right click and save as. Um, so I love excavating this, this giant, uh, you know, mass of, of, of culture. And I feel like with memes, I get to ex express myself um, in a text and visual register and make them uh, gestalt into something something new that we will conveniently call a meme. But um, between that and then the circulation of how many people can potentially see it, it's just I've, I've found and gravitated to a thing. Um, so this is a quote from Amiri Baraka. The word art is something the West has never understood. Art is supposed to be part of a community, like scholars are supposed to be part of a community. Artists decorate people's houses, their skin, their clothes to make them expand their minds. And it's supposed to be right in the community where they can have and when they want it. It's supposed to be as essential as a grocery store. That's the only way art can function naturally. And so when I think about this demand for art to be part and parcel with the community, it's not exactly the same. The, sort of handheld encounter with me and your phone. I think there's something to, um, you know, the low barrier of entry to participate in memes, um, their widespread circulation, the lack of mediation. That doesn't mean that there aren't, uh, you know, spurious terms of service on these platforms that can delete you at a whim but generally there are less loops to go through. If I wanna say something online, um, it's not hard to do. I can, you know, yell into cyber traffic, so to speak. This is Ramel Z. I'm gonna play this short uh, documentary clip. Artist, rapper, philosopher, Rem LZ. <laughs> I thought you'd know him. Answer these questions. Who made this art that you could only photograph in the dark? Rem LZ. Who looked like Voltron before Voltron? Rem LZ. Whose voice is this? And what does one call this style? That's the gangster dub. Who transforms subway writing into an art form and philosophy? Rem LZ. He says the only way to destroy a symbol is with a symbol, so in order to destroy a symbol, you have to arm a symbol. Who dress like a renaissance gangster samurai alien superhero? Rem LZ. Who made all these gods out of garbage and these weapons out of skateboards? Rem LZ. Who inspired a cult in Norway? I'm the cult of the rap, Who danced with Madonna? Who won a bet with John Michel Basquiat that he could paint Basquiat better than Basquiat? That's the end of this conversation. All I remember was the police officer saying, no, no, you're real man. Ram LZ. No, 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 no. The name in your passport. Ram LZ is the place. Ah, so it's not actually who, but what? So, yeah. Um. Ramel Z. This was like <laughs> when I was in 2008, just uh, my peak hype beast years, scrolling uh, various Nike message boards. I came across this hat and it was like $400. And 
it was a Ramel Z Supreme at. And, uh, you know, you can cringe at the context of which I found Ramel Z, but it uh, exposed me to his, his art, his oof, his whole philosophy. And then far rock away in New York, Ramel Z began spraying graffiti on New York City subway cars as a teen, already enraptured by the power of the alphabet. He worked across media to investigate the currency of letters as weapons and as elements in mathematical equations. The artist adopted the name Ramel Z, which he viewed as a mathematical equation. Through graffiti, hip hop, painting, and sculpture, Ramel Z reimagined the alphabet's historical trajectory in a 1979 manifesto entitled Iconic Treatise on Gothic Futurism. The artist asserts that letters, when separated from their literary function, are weapons that can be harnessed to battle the oppression imposed by counterfeit linguistic systems. Those aesthetic may appear rooted in science fiction. Ramel Z saw a fundamental link between the cryptic script of 16th century monks and his own late 20th century conception of the alphabet. So when I, tr when I try to think uh, through Ramel Z, I'm thinking about, uh, I'm not trying to create like a, a Basquiat Ramel Z uh, dichotomy, but I am saying that there is something I find um, honorif honorific, uh, mystifying about artists who, um, especially given the time, um, donned persona and didn't like to be in front of the camera, um, sort of an antecedent to, to MF Doom, the recently passed rapper, and, and something about, um, you know, creating a persona, but at the same time, um, the persona is merely a sort of launching pad that centers the work. Um, and I just think about how in this social media era with nonstop connectivity and that you don't really have uh, the mystique of the artist so much anymore. It's much harder to maintain. And um, from LZ, just his, his philosophy of language, you know, if you, if you read it, you'll, you'll see that he was, he was on his Derrida shit uh, just as well as Derrida. This is a pen and pixel work, uh, the cover of a juvenile record, the G code. Pen and pixel was a graphic design studio in Houston. I'm pretty sure they've done over a thousand uh, album artworks. This is a Silk the Shocker, charge it to the game. And then there's a share poster for an HBO special. Um, my work is definitely informed by them. I like the collage style. Um, I know that what they would do is they would take every element and uh, photograph it in front of a green screen and then go into Photoshop and layer those elements together. Um, there's almost like a psychedelic quality to the perspective of the compositions. This is Jet Set Radio future. I'm just going to play a brief intro to this game. This game came out in 2012 or 2002. I was 12 years old. I used to come home from school, put on my headphones and play this game. Um, the premise of the game is uh, it's this futuristic Tokyo toe where this authoritarian authoritarian government is trying to ban all creative expression. So what do you do? You mob up with your friends on high powered rollerblades and you graffiti the shit out of Tokyo and police and it's fucking awesome. And I, I would like to think that um, some of my um, impulses, reflexes in the meme space are to you know, metaphorically grind rails and spray paint the fuck out of Web 2.0 and Mark Zuckerberg's internet.
Yeah, this is DJ Professor K, baby, the master of mayhem, know what I'm saying? Bring you another Tokyo Underground Pirate Radio broadcast from Just Set Radio. I'm gonna bust into your head through your cute little ears and blow your mind with my sexy voice and out of sight sounds. Those of you who phone the nose, please, should keep those tissues handy, suckers. Tokyo is being oppressed by the Rokaku Group, a mega enterprise headed by Rokaku Goji. Rokaku is using his money and influence to mess with everything, industry, society, and even our culture. And he's even got his eyes set on City Hall. Lately, Rokaku's been shaking down the government, passing that Rokaku law crap, even buying off the police department. This law ain't nothing but garbage. It's just some selfish little punk's way of trying to show he's a big man. Rokaku and his gang are trying to stomp out our culture left and right. They don't give a rip about our rights. All they care about is profit. And some spineless fools have already become flunkies in their diabolical scheme. You better believe they're listening on this broadcast. But even in all this heat, there's a group of young kids who are tearing up the streets. I'm talking about the roots. These kids have set up and buried Tokyo and defeated. And now they're all wrapped up in their own little territory of tug of war. The hottest team at the moment is the Gigi. There's Yo-Yo, a guy who blow your mind with silver tongue. And Gump, a real cool lady who leaves a trail of broken hearts wherever she goes. And let's not forget their leader, a self-styled genius that goes by the name of Korn. These three in your garden will ride street punk. You know what I'm saying? Lately, Tokyo's been on one bad trip. The attack on the record store in Chuo. Yeah. So this is a, an excerpt from First Person Shooter Ideology, The Cultural Contradictions of Call of Duty by Daniel Bessner. The connections between the military and gaming commu community span decades, going all the way back to 1962 when MIT students created the first modern video game on a computer funded by the Department of Defense. These links have remained remarkably stable over time. In 1999, the US Army granted the University of Southern California 45 million to found the Institute for Creative Technologies, whose mission in the reporter Addie Robertson's words was to draw on new entertainment tools to build military training simulations. Then on July 4th, 2002, the military released America's Army which according to the deputy director of Army Game Studio, allows players to learn about being a soldier by taking on the role of an American soldier, participating in force on force operations as part of a team. The most recent edition of America's Army Proving Grounds came out in 2015. Moreover, military veterans have regularly consulted with game developers to make first person shooters more realistic and in the process, valorize and romanticize the U.S. armed forces. Most infamously, Iran-Contra plotter and one time, NRA chief Oliver North appeared in the second Black Ops game for which he was a paid consultant. So I guess, um, you know, putting this quote against the uh, clip of this 2002 Japanese graffiti video game, I'm just thinking about uh, how important video games were in my childhood. I don't play them much anymore. And part of that is just the overwhelming um, abundance of military shooters, the annualization of Call of Duty, um, the ginormity of games that where you have a gun in your hand and the, the goal independent of the narrative is to simulate uh, imperialist conquest. Um, so I think a game like Jet Set Radio, over time it appreciates in terms of how original it was and continues to be in an oversaturated uh, US imperialism simulator market. Um, and then I guess I'm gonna jump a little bit far ahead trying to be cognizant of time. Um, so I think back in November, uh, Georgie, Payne approached me about doing a, an exhibition of my memes. And I was like, yes, <laughs> fuck yeah. Where, where do I have to sign? You know, 1099, let's go, let's do it. Um, and then I immediately thought about um, how I would create a hub to experience the memes that are like removed from 
social media. And this website was a great opportunity to just, uh, I guess, perform a, a love letter to gaming as, as I, as I knew it and showcase the memes, um, reconnect with Manuel um, to write a new text. And then um, my buddy Clay did the web dev and here's just a, a quick video of, of yachtmetaphor.com website. Can you see it now? Yeah. And there's doc functionality and annotations for each meme. just for the show, which hopefully I can sell for as NFTs with with foundation when they partner with me. Stop playing dumb. Uh, yeah, so just in the interest of time, that's uh, gonna wrap up my speech. In a presentation, and uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you for that great presentation. Uh, I saw a longer version of it, but sorry, this cat wants something. I saw a longer version of it um, a couple weeks ago when you did it for a, some other institution. Um, but yeah, maybe you could talk a little bit <clears throat> about realism. Uh, you know, this critique of capitalist realism from Mark Fisher, rest in peace. Uh, and then also how in your work, you're kind of rejecting socialist realism in favor of something we could call like socialist ironism or irony aesthetics. So maybe yes. you could speak about that because socialist realism has been uh, critiqued or lambasted for being you know, heavily morally didactic and simplistic, having very simplistic psychology of, of character and narrative. So in your, in your socialist or post-socialist aesthetics, are you, uh, you see more into irony than realism, right? Yeah, um, great question. Just, uh, I appreciate the nice little tea ball there for me. Uh, <laughs> no, but uh, capitalist, Realism, Mark Fisher's text basically talks about uh, neoliberalism, not just as a um, bureaucratic system or um, the cultural um, sector of, um, let's say, managerial capitalism, um, but, but really it talks about an, an over-determination um, of, yeah, capitalism in, in, our, um, in our imaginations. And so that even when we think of um, alternatives to capitalism, they are still tightly enclosed in a capitalist realism. So there's an imaginative ceiling um, that is, I guess, endemic to, to the times, to, to living in the, the neoliberal hellscape. Um, what is the outside? Is there an outside? And I guess over the years, like creating memes, especially as, you know, a black person and these overwhelmingly white uh, communist socialist spaces um i guess from from jump there's like 
I just have an idea that, uh, or a guiding notion that like, for a lot of uh, white socialist oriented memers, um, or whatever the fuck, that it's easier, you know, if, if we go back into this capitalist realism framework, it's easier to imagine communism than it is to imagine black liberation. And so like the extremes of black liberation, those demands are often outside of the epistemological like purview and framework of white communist, white. And I'm not saying all, um, and I don't want, want things to get too lost in the sauce, but there is typically a, um, in terms of that socialist realism, it to me translates to a a, a socialist uh, naivete or, or almost like a flattening of yeah like uh, a black liberatory perspective or you know where's the room for an intersectional politic um, you know a lot of a lot of like white socialist memers like to just throw around the word worker and worker does have extreme like you know worker is approximate we are workers we have labor we produce value but you know uh not all workers are created equal and the history of labor in this country is the history of an entire group being dehumanized uh, before even being made legible as uh, humans and workers. So it's just a different, um, again, I'm probably going to say the word epistemology like 70 more times, but we're coming from a completely different worlds of, of knowledge that uh, the conversation that needs to be happening doesn't happen. And I think um, some of the impetus of my memes is to steer the conversation towards the more complicated um, demands and to basically not let um, white leftists get comfortable. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. I know um, Tiffany Lothabo King has some stuff that resonates with what you're saying about the limits of the concept of worker and work. So it, uh, it resonates with uh, this idea that, you know, the idea of work itself is, is built on the back of enslavement and anti-Blackness. You can, you can only value the work of some unspecified mass of workers against uh, the dehumanized, exploited, natively alienated, socially dead uh, facet of, of a society that, that, that really is, that oppression is really what makes the idea of labor possible for it. Yeah, just, uh, I forget who it was, but it was something you definitely uh, dropped. I, I forget the name, The Fetish Revisited. Whoever um, the author of that is, I watched one of their lectures and they were talking about how Marx um, used, you know, this entire disfranchised uh, group of Africans, slaves, as the metaphor to create the worker. So it's, you, you could argue that like, uh, <laughs> there was even like a, <laughs> like a blackface element to, um, you know, a Marxist labor analytic. <laughs> because like, in order to like concept the worker of a worker, like the non-worker, Slave. Yeah, I know that in um, Eric Lott's book, uh, Love and Theft, just kind of about the origins of minstrelsy, he talks exactly about that. Uh, her early minstrelsy, like late 19th century, early 20th century, was kind of a space for, for expression of affect that wasn't allowed to be expressed in the normative society. So that even included uh, like you know, worker positive, union organizing, socialist type affect within this scope of blackness. 
So it's not far removed from the conversation if we can conceive of the digital scape as, as having ties to uh, you know, blackface as being a kind of digital blackfaces, as is the parlance, right? So of course you would see some of these kinds of affects uh, expressing themselves in modern American leftist culture, right? It's like waking up to, to clock into blackface on your Instagram account to, to do socialism or whatever. Yeah, I was gonna, the time has passed, but I was gonna make like a love and basketball joke. Cause you said the name of the book was like love and, but that, sh that ship has sailed. It's like my internet went out. <laughs> Cool, yeah, let's talk about maybe your exhaustion too. The, uh, <laughs> yeah. the rumor mill, the rumor mill that you're gonna retire and all this stuff. Let's, let's address that. Yeah, rumors. this is it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Well, I think like the context in which I've made the memes has always been um, downtime when I'm not at my job, just trying to survive. The whole imperative for making memes wasn't like, um, originally it wasn't just uh, you know, a, a, must, a mustache twirling uh, conceptual gesture. It was like, the, po the poems aren't getting published. Um, I don't have money for a fucking studio. So I, I gotta make these memes. Like this is how I get my work out there. Um, but I guess the most recent wave of um, kind of exhaustion and just feeling like wrapping it up that this shit is like cooked and it's kind of a dub and like, what do I, I don't need to make 70 more memes about police brutality. Like that doesn't, <laughs> like, I don't, no one needs that. Um, but yeah, the uprisings last year, um, my page got boosted in a week, I got 2000 followers and suddenly there were big uh, white run meme pages sharing memes that I had made three, four years ago that have been speaking about, uh, you know, police brutality and just like the anti-black nature of, of the United States. And suddenly they had this trendy, uh, fashionable valence and, and most importantly, capital to them. Um, and so it was like soul sucking to, uh, gain traction for my main page under like such dire circumstances of like, uh, you know, anti-blackness being made, uh, you know, mainstream common knowledge, um, after a succession of, of death and you know, if you go back to Arya Dean's, like, uh, what is it? Um, poor, poor meme, rich meme, and just like, so that that theory that she laid out was like made actionable in the summer when a whole bunch of black memers pages got boosted, tied to this circulation of of black death, and so like that's not something that I want to continue. That's not something that I just want to participate in anymore. It's just like, it's ugly. And it's just, it's, it, it makes it feel like uh, my meme page is at any given point, someone else's cause celeb. And that's not a good feeling uh, to be instrumentalized in that way. So I just want, I want to be done or, or if I don't full stop retire, I'll drop a meme like every once in a while and have, have built conditions that people actually give a fuck when I post something. Yeah, I, I can see that this uh, exhibitions like format where you're presenting the retrospective as well as the new memes, you're kind of gesturing toward that in a way, like pulling it off of the circulation of social media putting it into its own space of, of contemplation, right? 
giving it this oceanic vibe, um, you know, bringing up like you know, the ocean of the internet, the deep web, et cetera. So I'm interested to hear more about uh, maybe like the selection process, why you chose to uh, showcase it in the way that it looks, you know, a server rack in the middle of the ocean with a kind of like fire screen selection for the meters and then the annotations. I mean, kind of a general question. But... Yeah. Um... Yeah, in terms of the server rack at the bottom of the ocean, um, that's just a more realized idea of the abyss. Um, and it and it relates to um, over time the concept of the page evolving from a that's so raven joke more to thinking about um, the middle passage. Um, you know, and the the race crafting, the extreme like brutal violence required over that ocean that, you know, every every time I say the word incalculable, I'm like, that's a manny word. But just the incalculable um, loss. And so pairing the incalculable loss of the middle passage with the um, extreme uh, nanosecond calculation of these giant fiber optic oceanic cables of the internet, the infrastructure of the internet. Um, and thinking about like, you know, that middle passage violence is like the condition of possibility <laughs> for, you know, a giant information apparatus such as the internet. And, um, and also, um, in terms of yachts, like it's hilarious to me that there's like a distinction be to be made between um, a mega yacht and a super yacht, um, just vessels that are really just, um, you know, billionaire luxury wealth flaunting uh, environmentally costly like there's no, <laughs> we just don't need yachts. <laughs> like that doesn't mean I, I wouldn't want to ride a yacht one time in my life, but just the idea of yachts is, um, yachts are a metaphor for um, the insane wealth inequality. <laughs> That's what they are. They're like wealth inequality vessels. Um, and then just thinking about the abyss in terms of like, you know, there's obviously like Lovecraftian, but it's it's a surface level Lovecraft. But then just like uh, existentially, um, thinking about blackness as uh, fugitive. There's something about um, a depth that can never be known. Um, and I guess like, yeah, I'm. I'm also trying to be conscious of like the darkness and blackness kind of uh, uh, Nicomachean, you know, Western metaphor and not doing that again through the abyss. Um, I guess I'll say what I have before um, in terms of the music as well. No one's asked me about the music. Well, they have, but not on screen. Um, so the intro music is, um, it's a song called Lavish by Twista featuring Pharrell. And the lyrics are like negligible. Really for me, it's the instrumental. And I was just thinking about how much I love the Neptunes production as a kid, all of the hits they made. But Lavish in particular has, I think all the elements that, um, encapsulate what yacht metaphor is. You have these pulsating um, African drums, this, these, these drums, the technology, the satellite technology of drums. Uh, and then you have like the futuristic sense. And then it all is kind of glued together by this elegant aspirational key, uh, piano. And um, I don't know, it's like, you know, there's things about Pharrell as black celebrity and 
what, what comes with a certain level of black celebrity is like, yeah, you're gonna do something that's just like, you know, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> why did you do that? You didn't need to do that. Like, why are you saying that? This is actively harming the masses of black people. Like why you don't, is the Adidas check that, that good, you know? But I guess like part of me was like an internal dialogue and being like, yeah, Pharrell can like, you know, be a coon and have to navigate being a coon sometimes. But when I hear those fucking beats, like that's some like, that's some African shit. That's some like ontological African shit, you know? Um, and then the whole like fighting game, uh, I mean, that's just like, that's parallel to what I'm doing. Like, I don't wanna have to fight. I don't wanna have to, um, you know, like what I'm doing, I'm, I wanna champion like the right for, um, I wanna like, <laughs> I don't want black artists to like, get to where they get overcoming odds, like this tired story of, uh, overcoming uh, circumstance, like it's just tiresome. And you know, that statement, you have to work four times as hard as like a white person to get half. Um, I can't like concretely uh, qualify those measurements, but damn it, I, I feel it. Um, you know, and I know, I know my work isn't for everybody and I'm, I don't try to make it for everyone, but um, yeah, I guess the labor intensity, which is self-wrought of making these dense, uh, beautiful images, but then just, uh, you know, not knowing how they're gonna be received in the world and knowing that they're not, they're not easy to get through, to laugh at or to think through. Um, but all in all, yeah, it's it's um, <laughs> it's pretty exhausting. <laughs> I'm burned out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're describing a kind of intense process of identification with the void, right? Rejecting uh, European epistemologies of knowledge that are, I think you said Nicomachean. You might have meant Manichaean. Yeah, that's what I meant, Manichaean. Thank yeah, Manichaean, you. where light is knowledge and good, and God and dark is ignorance and void and negation. Yeah, and exactly. Bad. So instead, you're kind of reversing that and saying that in the void, there's uh, something of value to be stumbled upon, right, in this unlit space. Uh, and it, it makes me think of this question that I have like in this space of identification with the void. Uh, you're, you're kind of bringing in a pedagogical angle to the, the content, which I find really interesting. I think people, you know, I mean, most people nowadays, I would say learn more from memes than from school, but learning still isn't a cool thing, right? But I'm interested in, in makers, uh, creators and thinkers that they do think something is cool about learning and study, even in this kind of weaponized way, uh, with your reference to Ramel Z, right? weaponizing the letter form, making it a vehicle in interstellar cosmic space for a kind of <laughs> cosmic war, you know, against the abstractions that have, uh, the European abstractions that have chained us for so long. So yeah, yeah. talk about pedagogy well, if you want, or talk about whatever you want. It was, it was nice. The other day, um, someone Venmoed me a hundred bucks and they were just like, I've been using your page as, as a teaching module and my my class, I've been directing them to your page. So, boom. Um, so that, that was nice. Um, but I guess, you know, I don't wanna be like didactic. Like, I don't wanna tell people how to think or what to think. I just wanna create, um, um, I wanna stage, like occasions where they're forced to grapple with contradiction and uh, come out of it on the other side. And 
I know that with the medium of, of the meme, I know that, uh, you know, the context is the attention economy. There's so many other things to look at. There's just something overwhelmingly uh, negligible about what I produce. But to me, that like ups the, the ante of, of making something that stops people from scrolling. Um, and I guess like what I've learned <laughs> reflecting on my own learning style is that I, I don't like to be told what to think, but I do like to uh, have to think through things. Um, so I guess the memes I make, yeah, I, I try to um, sort of insert a little bit of theory, you know, a little bit more than a surface level of an idea or to take an idea and make it into uh, like an action or stage that theory or to name um, an instance of that theory. And then, yeah, hopefully people um, through their um, wow or OMFG or WTF or whatever, like that's them signaling that they're being forced to think through. And if it's humorous, Again, going back to this idea of spontaneous laughter, um, hopefully they've opened up and, and conceded um, a certain sort of lens and now they're allowing themselves to really sit with and engage the work. And I know like the work is a meme, but I love the memes have the potential and capacity to do that. But I just want to uh, desacredize so that something sacred can happen. It's a very circuitous over and over again process. Destroy and rebuild, you know? Yeah, and just before we drift too far from, uh, because you, you said sacred, so I wanted to explicitly mention the person that you talked about, uh, Jay LaRond Mattery, M-A-T-O-R-Y. Dr. Mattery runs the Sacred Arts of the Black Atlantic Collection at Duke University. And he wrote a book that Jensen referenced called The Fetish Revisited. It looks at the anti-Black concept of fetish, which is a European concept uh, projected onto Africans about uh, capricious ideas of objects having animacy or agency. Uh, and so it's the way of demonizing African spiritual and material practices which has been very uh, productive and capacious in uh, European social theory. So he looks at Marx's use of fetish in the economic concept, and then Freud's use of fetish in the psychosexual concept. But then he also kind of looks at their own fetishisms, like Marx's uh, relationship to different things like the piano, relating to his like middling bourgeois status, his loss of class status. Uh, Freud and like, you know, intaglio rings from the Roman Empire, uh, the chair, the chaise long chair that the patient sat in, uh, his statue collection, the cigar, obviously. So it's a really interesting book that kind of tries to flip the idea of fetish on its head and look at the fetishisms of European thought. But yeah, I just wanted to mention Mattery, he's a great thinker and a great thinker of the sacred, great thinker of the profane. Great thinker of networks. So I wanted to mention him explicitly before we move on to a, a different topic or stay on the same topic. <clears throat> yeah, what you're saying, it makes sense that you would be exhausted from this constant iteration, uh, constant performance of affect, circulation of content. Uh, you know, to your point, it is overwrought on your on your extent. You add that aspect to it, but there's a reason you're doing that, right? You're laboring over these to a greater extent for a reason. You're doing that for not just an aesthetic reason, but like a critical reason, right? And you you call it Bougetto, for people that don't know. 
the Bougetto, black folk socialist, Rococo type of aesthetic, right? Yeah. Compacted resonances. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's let's talk about poetry a little bit too. Maybe we can bring in poetry. It's been the textual aspect has been neglected, but you you gave us a great starting point with Ramelzi. Um, yeah. We should briefly maybe trace this out. Uh, Tracy one sixty eight was a graffiti writer from the Bronx. He developed what was called wild style. Uh, if you've seen, you know, vandalism on corporate property, you've seen that there are ones that are simpler, you know, just lines. Those are those are called tags, right? Then you see bubble uh, letters. And so those will have fill-ins, outlines, more colors, two to three colors maybe. And they'll have a bubble shape. Uh, <clears throat> and then the more complex ones are called wild style. Right? So that's something that Chase 168 developed in the late 60s and the 70s. Uh, and it has to do with ornamenting the letter, taking the letter form as a kind of basis for different gestures of complexity. Uh, and so Ramelzi is critically important, not just in the visual, but also in the performative, because he was thinking about wild style, not just as something about letters, but something about being in the world. So wild style almost as a kind of way of being, uh, an abstract or ornamented way of being. So you've, uh, I don't know if it was intentional or not, but you've laid out a great space for us to think about text and poetry and linguistic narrative, textual abstraction in the context of your practice, you know, from poetry to memes, but also in general. Yeah. Um, well, I guess there's a lot of um, poetic techniques that I didn't experiment with on works on paper, but in terms of the memes, I think a lot about um, deploying like uh, popular text from pop culture franchises, like an Avengers logo. And, you know, the Avengers, the text um, carries something in it, but I, I guess it's like, you know, it can go, it can just be like a gesture of determinant, you know, um, but it's also investigating like the way in which um these texts are like like even just the font style is a vessel of communication like the um the form contains content just as much as the content does if that makes sense and so there's something about taking um these these texts these icon iconographies of like big budget um blockbuster films and our eyes are are sort of attuned and they're trained trained to them because they're so prevalent in pop culture and then completely um inverting or, or deconstructing the meaning for something else um that i find powerful um eye popping it's like a really nice um visual turn it, it keeps people on their on their heels um so i'm into that um one thing i'm trying to get more into is learning a Ado uh, adobe illustrator more so i can get into more um sort of the, the acid graphics calligraphy text and and taking over that iconography of these like club flyers that uh, have this compulsion to like include ch chains and like barbed wire <laughs> for whatever reason just like and just abject abjection to to promote their like their their raves you know and what's that all about you know and uh, just trying to use those visual languages to say some some real shit but that's like another skill i have to develop and see if i want to develop it 
Um, I don't mean to interrupt, but this does tie to a question that we have from the audience, which comes from Leslie. She asks, I wonder how you feel about nostalgia, especially the longing for web 1.0 almost. Do you feel aesthetics and visual styles are fruitful ways to cope with the present? Is that is that a question for me or? I guess it's for both of you. Mm, I mean, it seems like we've just we we've been on a nostalgia loop from like the 1960s on. Like, I'm always like, it's the 90s again. It's the 90s again. Jeans are baggy again. It's the 90s again. Um, so I think. I mean, Fisher has said some things about nostalgia as like uh, some sort of imaginative bankruptcy to just return to the past. You know, it just points it that we're not imagining futures. And, I, and I'm not saying that's just like as innocuous as we haven't figured out new ways to wear pants, but that um, is tied to like, we haven't figured out new ways to, uh, you know, wither away the state like those two things are interrelated so i don't know like my impetus is if we're going to revisit if i'm going to reference the past in my work i'm going to have a message that points to a future that is beyond the politics of of this pop culture reference not just cheap uh, revisitation and nostalgia Yeah, I don't know if I'm supposed to answer that, but uh, maybe this is a good time to transition to audience questions. If any have uh, accumulated or if anyone wants to just pop on and talk. Yeah, that question was for you there, right? Um, Leslie did say if you have anything to say about that, it can be uh, extended to both. And, but yeah, if anybody wants to use the raise hand function in the reactions uh, bar to see if they want to ask a question in person or drop a question in the chat, by all means, go for it. Yeah, I would say we all have to grapple with nostalgia. Hortense Spiller says that commemorative or nostalgic thinking is a license to stop doing the work. So it's almost like you know, because if you're commemorating or if you're nostalgic, it means that something's in the past. Uh, so she talks about, you know, I've been spotlighted. Oh, okay. She talks about, for example, uh, slavery museums, Holocaust museums, those kinds of institutions. So at a much larger scale, you know, institutional levels of memory. Um, but we can we can kind of trans transpose that down to much smaller scales, like you know, my own memory thinking about how nostalgia does have this aspect of uh, governance or discipline, or uh, it does the work that Spiller says it does, of stopping or licensing people for stopping doing the work, right? Giving you a reason to put down your work and say, oh, we're done, it's in the past, we can move on, we've commemorated. Uh, so when I grapple with my own nostalgia, I, I think of it in those in those ways um, that the, you know my own personal workings of memory ha have been influenced by those institutional centralized platforms of, of memory, like museums or the news, etc. Yeah, thank you for that great question. Spike has a question for Jensen. Um, it was interesting to hear you throw in at the end of your presentation that you might be selling those new memes as NFTs on foundation. Given the anti-capitalist rhetoric running through your work, how do you square that ethically with creating NFTs, which parentheses, aside from being antithetical for numerous environmental reasons, are a speculative capital capitalist market commodifying these digital assets, meaning the first artists getting into the market 
make money, but smaller later artists lose their shit without continuous supply of buyers entering the market? Yeah, great question. All right, so I wanted to piggyback on that because also NFTs are really bad for the environment. So throw it more on top of the critique. There you go. Answer that too. <laughs> um, can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, I, I won't square it. Um, perhaps I'll rhombus or trapezoid that question. But um, in all seriousness, I don't, uh, I don't have like uh, an NFT with the WIF foundation or whatever. Um, it was like a joke or just trying to will it into existence. But, um, you know, I'm not sold on uh, NFTs. Um, I think all NFTs have done thus far is recapitulate the art market. But with that, there's been like a massive, terrible, like FIFA, like tech demo 3D art. Um, I think it's it's important and meaningful that like people was able to um you know like people is the face of nft art digital art like this like people looks like silicon valley tech bro incarnate um legacy russell had a good take on nfts thus far as just like this site of performative finance which so far you know that tech bro billionaires can buy these um, digital artworks for $69 million and $420,000, you know, and, and make a joke and spectacle. Um, it's like, we know the market's a joke, but again, it's just playing out even more in the space. Um, and I think like, the market is calibrated to the Ayn Rand and Nick Landian philosophies that a lot of these like white tech bros uh, subscribe to. So to me, NFTs don't represent this like uh, democratizing benchmark, um, uh, a new economy with a low barrier of entry. I think it's like, phenomenal transfers of value are predicated on like who um, has access and control of those markets, whatever they are. Like capitalism demands new uh, novel variated markets. And I think NFTs are just the next, the next uh, chopping block and there's exacerbated by a pandemic. You know, I, I think that's why they are having this moment, this premacy. And uh, yeah, they're, you know, the ecological toll to mine Ethereum is like insane. Um, so yeah, long story short, I think NFTs are stupid. Spike says, thanks and agreed. See you space cowboy. <laughs> On that note, um, I think we have time for a few more questions if anyone has any. Well, if not, thank you so much for having me. And thank you, Jensen, for your great work. George, Feel free to jump in if you have any uh, last words. Thank yeah, you, Manny. I, I was going to say if you wanted to throw any last thoughts on the billboard, Jensen, the process, getting that approved. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, that wasn't fun, but part of me feels like um, the, le the legal team just were kind of like, no, we don't want to go through the trouble. We could put this up, but we just don't want to have to deal with it, the fallout. Um, that's my gut feeling, um, but I'm satisfied with what's up there. And it's surreal to um, anytime you're working in like a digital medium or not thinking about where your work is going to go for it to break through the screen and exist on a billboard. Um, it's wild. Uh, yeah. Cool. 
Well, if there's no more questions, then go to yachtmetaphor.com. Check it out. Thank you so much to both of you for for participating. It's a really great conversation. Thank you. It was great. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Yeah, that was amazing. Thank you all so much and have a, a wonderful 420. <laughs> mm -hmm.